um, some of our work in studying mechanical cues in the tumor lymphatic niche of the tumor microvitamin and how these cues contribute to uh, metastasis. And as you can see from this image of a collagen matrix um, and a lumen border on the right, um, some of the cues that we might be interested in uh, our collagen density, so fiber content, and the orientation of the fibers, and how they might direct cancer cell invasion or lymphatic vessel growth. So, from a more more of a big picture perspective, we all know that the tumor microenvironment consists of uh, many biochemical and biophysical cues that contribute to cancer progression. Um, a lot of these cells, the stromal cells, fibroblasts, can become cancer associated. Uh, we have tumor associated macrophages, but we can also have tumor associated um, ECM signatures. So when I talk about tumor associated ECM, um, a typical example is that primary tumors secrete a lot of fiber, um, fibular collagen into their surrounding margin and that creates a very dense mesh, almost like a shield, protecting them. Um, another tumor-associated collagen signature is the fiber alignment of the fibers. Um, typically, if you have more invasive tumors, you see a lot of um, perpendicular fibers, uh, perpendicular to the margin of the tumor, suggesting that they're kind of aligned tracks for tumor cells to migrate up into. So what I'm really focused, in, focused on presenting today are some of those uh, signatures that I just mentioned, density and fiber alignment in particular. And all of those can be kind of grouped under um, the broad term of mechanical confinement. So in a little bit more detail, what is mechanical confinement? It's really just... Um, the restriction of a cell due to a physical surface. So some examples here we see are aligned collagen fibers where a cell can use those aligned fibers as tracks to migrate. Um, fibular collagen in terms of density, how they're kind of uh, meshed into the matrix. Um, cells can also use existing structures in their environment to migrate along or migrate within such as blood, blood vessels and lymphatic vessels, or even using fiber, uh, muscle fiber, and uh, migrating in between those interstitial spaces. So what I will present today is looking at density and fiber alignment, and how those contribute to uh, cancer metastasis. And so a little bit more on our hypotheses or topics um, is that for density, we believe increased collagen density promotes a tumor lymphatic vascular phenotype, and that potentially contributes to lymphatic metastasis. Um, and then for the second topic, collagen fiber alignment is a potent driver of lymphangiogenesis and potentially tumor lymphangiogenesis. Uh, Karina is leading our efforts in the first topic, so I'm just going to highlight some of the key data that we've collected, and then I'll go on to speaking a little bit more about fiber alignment. So in terms of collagen density, um, there's been a lot of work in the literature demonstrating that increased collagen density promotes tumor growth and tumor invasion. So if we look at some of these data presented here, uh, looking at the growth of 231 cells in a mouse model, and this is work presented by the Keeley lab, they, they demonstrate that there's a lot higher proliferation in the higher density case, and when we look at the invasiveness of the cancer cells in a mouse model, the higher density typically facilitates more invasion into the surrounding uh, tissue. And this is using in vivo, in vitro, 3D, and in vitro 2D assays. And they all demonstrate that at the higher collagen densities, you have more invasive phenotypes of the cancer cells. 
Uh, interestingly, I mentioned earlier that the primary tumor secretes a dense matrix of collagen fibers around themselves, and that can act kind of like a shield preventing, um, for instance, immune cells to infiltrate and kill them. And this work um, has demonstrated that in cases where you have increased collagen density, that sort of a thick collagen margin around the tumor prevents the infiltration of cytotox cytotoxic T cells from killing off the cancer cells. So in the top AB panel, they're showing uh, collagen staining with fecal serous red and correlating the off-code density to collagen content. And then in panel B, the T cells are in brown. So you have a large distribution of T cells where there's less collagen. And then in panel C and D, where you have more collagen, there's very few T cells in the surrounding matrix. So a lot of work has been looking at how collagen density affects the primary tumor in cancer cell migration or invasion. Um, not much work has looked at the tumor microenvironmental components like vasculature. So this is a very recent paper, 2017 paper from uh, Cynthia Reinhardt King's lab, looking at how matrix stiffening um, and density can promote a tumor vascular phenotype. And so some hallmarks of tumor vasculature is that they're um, malformed, they don't form nice junctions, uh, they're hyperpermeable, and they form very poor networks. So in these images shown here, uh, the top left one is just showing permeability of two different cases. Uh, VAPN is a compound that uh, prevents the cross-linking of collagen. So you have uh, lower stiffness collagen on the left, and the control is higher stiffness collagen. And they put in an extra and then show that the permeability of the lower stiffness collagen is actually more normal, it's normalized as compared to the higher stiffness collagen, where the vessels are a lot leaky, a lot leaky. And then in terms of how these networks form, they demonstrate that in the low stiffness collagens, the networks form very nicely. They have um, <coughs> nice morphology, nice junctions, whereas compared to the high stiffness collagen, the cells are very unhappy and they seem to be more more in a apoptotic state. So the main takeaway point and sort of in inspiration that we can take away from this paper for our work is looking at some, measuring some of the hallmarks for lymphatic vasculature. Um, they were looking at blood vasculature, so for us, we can also see whether or not in different collagen densities we have lymphatic vasculature that are potentially malformed, hyperpermeable, or disorganized. So our question on what collagen density does to the lymphatic vasculature was sort of a accidental discovery, as most science is these days, or most good science is, is a little bit, ser a little bit of serendipity. Um, when we were actually developing the model, we cultured the vessels in different collagen densities, and we happened to see that at the higher densities of five and six mg per mil, there was uh, a reduced live fraction percentage of the LECs in the vessels, and we also saw some areas where there was cell detachment. So we wondered what were some of the reasons for um, these phenotypes. And so in our work, currently we've started to do a little bit more detailed characterization and more in-depth um, experimentation of that phenomena. And so in characterizing uh, the ECM, where we're using kind of the extreme ranges of low and high, three and six bits per mil, um, we can see that there's significant difference in terms of how the matrix is formed at these different densities. Uh, for three mix per mil, there's 
uh, definitely a lot less fiber content in the matrix compared to six. And in the six, we also see some thicker bundles of these collagen fibers forming, um, which could lead to higher stiffness as well. So what does increased collagen density do to our lymphatic vessels? Well, if we think back about how vasculature forms um, th from that paper I showed earlier, here we show that at the lower density, we have a very nice uniform confluent endothelium, whereas compared to the high density case, uh, we have very uh, leaky vessels and large areas of cell detachment. So that kind of demonstrates that the higher density here is contributing to the malformation of our lymphatic vessels. And consequently, that leads to an increase in vessel perme uh, permeability. So these vessels are hyperpermeable in the high density six big case. <clears throat> and we think that, or we hypothesize that the increase in hyperpermeability hyper and changes in the endothelium that we see are potentially a result of uh, increases in pro-inflammatory cytokines in the microenvironment. So when we did a panel of uh, inflammatory mediators in the vessel microenvironment, we saw a sevenfold increase in IL-6 for a six mg case and a two-fold increase for interferon gamma. So these were two of the more significant mediators that we measured. And so currently we're looking at how does blocking these uh, signaling pathways potentially help rescue vessel permeability or some of that uh, cell detachment that we saw earlier. And also, does the permeability changes and morphology changes um, affected on these vessels contribute to more intravasation of cancer cells into the vessels? So looking at co-culturing uh, G31 cancer cells around the vessel, we're seeing whether or not uh, density changes contribute to their intravasation into the vessel. So are they utilizing those large holes in the vessel in a higher density to get into the vessel and potentially uh, migrate to distant sites. So we're doing some more uh, characterization and that collection for this aspect. And we're hoping to see that in the six mil <coughs> milligram per mil case, we do see higher intravasation. That's what we're hoping to see as compared to the three mil per mil where we have a more normalized vessel. Um, but if you look at some of the morphology of the cancer cells surrounding the vessel, the cancer cells in the three mg per mil seem to be a lot more elongated, more migratory. So they're moving a little bit more than as compared to in the six mg per mil where they're more rounded and clustered. So here we believe that the density which affects porosity of the matrix can also affect their migration. Um, so likely, so if we think about the in vivo context, likely at higher collagen densities, without stromal cell support, cancer cells can't get around the matrix. But potentially with stromal cell support, like fibroblasts to break down the matrix, they may be able to enter the vessels um, at a higher rate. Okay, so I just wanted to share a little bit of the density work that we've done, uh, some key points, and now I just want to look at how um, fiber alignment plays a role in the lymphatic, in the tumor lymphatic age. So, um, also from work coming out of the Healy lab, we demonstrated that metastatic tumors or invasive tumors, in that margin, there's typically a four to tax three signature, which is a more aggressive more aggressive tumor, you can see that the tumor, sorry, the fiber alignment is 
parallel, but it's, per it's perpendicular to the tumor margin as compared to the less aggressive tumor in tax one, where the fibers are more fibrillar, uh, curly, and randomly organized. So as you progress to more aggressive tumors, you get reorientation of these fibers um, as perpendicular tracks coming out of the tumor margin, potentially being used for cancer cell migration. And so they've also demonstrated that using these perpendicular fiber tracks, cancer cells are directionally more persistent in their migration, so that they migrate longer and farther using these tracks as compared to a random matrix where they have more choices to choose from. Um, interestingly, another group has shown that if you disrupt the fiber alignment around the primary tumor, you can actually restrict the growth and invasion of that tumor. Um, so if you disrupt the, uh, the enzyme that's responsible for cross-linking the fibers into that aligned profile, you see on the bottom here, the tumor has less growth and less invasion into the surrounding matrix as compared to the control where you have a lot of buffer. So that really just tells us that fiber alignment is a potent cue in the tumor microenvironment that cancer cells use or take advantage of for metastasizing. And again, as similar to what I um, described for collagen density, there hasn't been much work looking at how fiber alignment plays a role or contributes to the conditioning of the tumor microenvironment. So in particular, how it affects vasculature development and potentially conditioning of the vasculature to be more favorable for cancer cell migration. So in that, in that respect, uh, we wanted to look at how fiber alignment plays a role in uh, lymphangiogenesis and particularly tumor lymphangiogenesis. So using the device that I've described before, um, it's a double lumen device with a thin collagen sheet in the middle. We can use the sheet to control the fiber orientation and also provide chemo gradients for cells to uh, chemotaxis. So we've shown that we can get randomly or organized matrices in that sheet or aligned uh, matrices in the sheet. And we've also demonstrated that we can achieve stable chemo gradients over uh, 15 hours. And so putting those two together, if we look at fiber alignment, um, induction of sprouting lymphangiogenesis, where we have random, a random matrix on the left and an aligned matrix on the right, we see a significant pronounced uh, sprouting of the lymphatic vessel into the aligned matrices. Um, in the random case, you do see some sprouting. However, the cells are going towards sort of a physical surface along that edge. So it's really just showing that you know, cells typically love surfaces. And we all sort of know that. And they like to follow directional surfaces. And that's what really the aligned collagen is providing is that directional um, consistency in terms of the fiber of the tracks that forms. And so looking a little bit closer at how these networks are formed in the aligned matrices, we see that they can actually form very nice networks. So you have, uh, bus, you have cap capillaries forming and then connecting to each other in the aligned matrices, and they're forming nice networks uh, in the direction of the fiber alignment. So if we quantify the capillary network density in each of these different matrices, we can see that there is a significant um, increase in the capillary density for the aligned cases. And this is without any chemo gradients, any chemo sources to attract the cells 
or to help the cells form. And when we do add a gradient to the matrices, we see a pronounced effect. So we see sort of a synergistic effect between uh, biomolecular cues and biomechanical cues, where the growth factors are attracting the cells to grow in that region, but the fiber alignment is providing the directional uh, path for the capillaries to form. And I think what's interesting to note is that even with the added uh, biomolecular cues in the random matrices, it still doesn't form as dense of doesn't form as dense of a network as compared to the aligned case without uh, growth factors. So that potentially suggests that perhaps the alignment is more open in comparison to the molecular cubes that were sent in these cells. So what I'm currently doing is looking at how how the aligned matrices and then random matrices may affect uh, the different mechanical sensing complexes of these cells. So looking at focoadhesion kinases and integrins and their activation. Perhaps in the aligned matrices, we have more activation or polarization of the focoadhesion kinases, and that helps to guide um, the migration of the lymphatic cells and their proliferation. And then what I'm aiming to do is to co-culture these cells with different uh, cancer cells, so breast cancer cells, and potentially head and neck patient cells to see if we can uh, potentially use that platform as a drug screening platform for tumor lymphangiogenesis. And what's interesting here, this graph, um, so Jose and I, we did a panel of different pathways looking at the co-culture between lymphatic vessels and MCF7s and lymphatic vessels and MDA W231s. And we actually saw that the MCF7s are the more potent effectors in terms of conditioning these vessels. Um, so here looking at the androgenic uh, genes or androgenic genes, we see a, a more pronounced upregulation of genes related to the androgenesis for MCF7 co-cultures as compared to T3 co-cultures. And I guess that's just another another card in our pocket to demonstrate that MCF7s aren't really you know, these non-effectors that we think they are. And that two, three ones, although we think that they're metastatic and aggressive, they, they've already reached that metastatic state and may not be conditioning as conditioning as, say, MCF7s that haven't reached the metastatic state. So yeah, so we're going through a bunch of different pathways and looking at how the crosstalk between those cells uh, contribute to conditioning of the vessels. So I'd like to thank uh, Krina, who's done a tremendous job on the experiments and data collection and analysis on our projects. Uh, Bridget for fabrication and culture work. Jose, who's helped a lot with imaging and PCR panels. Uh, Maria for the uh, drug screening aspect. Alice, Pete, Dave, everyone else. Um, our collaborators in Paul Ferrari's lab and Suzanne Ponick. And the funding source from the head of the sport. And last but not least, happy <laughs> Valentine's Day. I hope your significant <laughs> other rubs your feet like Landon does for, <laughs> <laughs> for Vanessa. <laughs> so he's doing kind of my job today. <laughs>